It's time for the chip race. We are joined now by World Series of Poker main event champion, WSOP Europe main event champion, the winner of a record 14 WSOP bracelets, the inaugural national heads up poker champion. He's member of the WSOP Hall of Fame. He is eighth on the all time money list with almost 22 million in live tournament earnings. He is quite simply the biggest name in the history of the game. He is, of course, Phil the Poker Brat Helmet. Phil, welcome to the show. Yes, nice. Can you repeat that introduction? <laughs> 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 Sounded pretty good to me. <laughs> well, all of those accolades are earned, of course. Phil, in 1989, we'll start at the beginning, I guess. You won the WSOP main event, beating, of course, Johnny Chan heads up, depriving him of his hat trick. Uh, over your WSOP career, you have been in the money a staggering 126 times, made a whopping 57 final tables, and have, of course, won 14 bracelets. At just 24 years of age, though, did you have any sense of what was to come? Um Yes, you know, um, I started, uh, I did have a sense. I started writing, um, I'll never forget this night. It was March 1988 where I, uh, I was a professional poker player and I wasn't really doing much with my life. I remember, uh, going to a game. It was like a $2, $4 limit game. And I think I had like $25,000 in the bank, so it's really hard to play those stakes. You're going to swing $400, $500 max, right? And I remember going to this game on a bleak day in Madison, Wisconsin. No sunshine, and I just remember it was overcast. There was still snow on the ground, and I went to this game, and I was just like, I was out of my mind a little bit like, all right, you know, I was very dissatisfied where I was. And then, you know, I was not a, never a big pot smoker, never a big drinker. But that day, I convinced my friends to leave. We smoked some pot, and we went to a bar. And, uh, and we started playing pool, $10, $20 a game. And, uh, and I was very frustrated with the action. I wasn't very good at pool. And I just remember, like, waking up, like, many days go by, water flowing under <laughs> Many days go by, water flowing underground. Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. <laughs> like that talking head song where you just wake up. What the fuck am I doing with my life? And, you know, and I was just like, I went and I opened the side door to this bar. Decided to just get out of there. You know, I opened the side door and boom, I look out and the sun is just coming in. And it's hitting the melted snow piles. Now it's starting to snow, starting to melt on the curb about 15 yards in front of me. And so that's causing light to just be thrown up into my face from all different angles. And I'm in this dark, dingy bar, boom, open this door. And just the light was staggering. And I was like, wow, what is going on here? And I went straight to my apartment and I wrote down and I just, with this boundless amount of energy I seem to have, I wrote down a list of life goals at that moment and said, Hey, you're going to be great at poker. If you're going to do this, you're going to be great at the game. You know, I want to meet and marry an amazing woman. I want to buy uh, a really nice house. I want a really nice car. Four or five kind of goals that, you know, seemed obtainable. And then I added on there, write a New York Times bestseller, just because some of my friends like my writing. And, you know, one friend liked my writing. That was enough to hang a you know, <laughs> it was enough to hang a, a bold bowl like that on there. And then um, and then I while I was there, I wrote down this pyramid of success. And so I had like some blocks, you know, bottom block. Um, let's not do drugs. I was never a big drug guy. Let's not drink in excess. Let's avoid craps and blackjack and casino games. And then the next level up, you know, eat healthy and exercise and the top. You know, money management, which is the most important thing for a poker player in order to have a smooth life. You know, we we know talented guys that have rough lives. We know not as talented guys that have smoother lives because of money management. So I wrote this pyramid of success and I just seemed to have a boundless amount of energy that day. And it kind of like changed the course of my life. And um, my wife found that sheet of paper. Um, I didn't even I didn't even have a girlfriend at the time. My wife, my wife found it two years later um, and said, oh, my God, you've achieved all your life goals already. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> and um, 
and accept one. And, you know, and I remember in 2004 getting a phone call. And, you know, I was at the Lowe's Hotel in Santa Monica. Great setting. Sun's out. Get a phone call. Pick it up. It's a 212 number. All right, that's New York. Pick it up. And it's Harper Collins. Hey, Phil, your book just hit the New York Times bestseller list. And so <laughs> I had a lot of checks. Check 88, check 89 when the main event was on my, my goal sheet. That was a big goal. Won it in 89, check. Uh, met my wife, married her by 90. We're still married 28 years later. She's perfect for me. Check, check, check. You know, bought a beautiful penthouse condominium um, in 1989. I mean, like a baller place. This was meant to be my bachelor pad. And uh, I was going to start. I hadn't had much sex for four years. I was going to open up my life a little bit. Before that even started, boom, my wife popped in. And so I have no regrets. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, you know, that's kind of a little bit of my story. In 1993, you won three bracelets in three days, which is unquestionably one of the great WSAP achievements of all time. Crazily, Ted Forrest completed a hat trick that same year in the same time frame. What, to your mind, are the other great WSOP achievements? Well, you have to think about it, like, right? I mean, um, you know, Johnny Chan going first in 87, first in 88, and second to me in 89. That's a great achievement. Um, Ted Forrest won three bracelets that year. Phil Ivey won three bracelets in the modern area. Era. I had three seconds in 2012, which is pretty cool because um, the fields were just much bigger. Um, you know, that same year, 1993... I won three bracelets, Ted Forrest won three bracelets, and John Vanetti won two bracelets, eight of them between us. Uh, another, I think, cool moment for poker was 2003, when everybody was talking about this bracelet race. It was me, Chan, and Brunson having this bracelet race. And that year, I want to say there were 35 tournaments in 03, and Chan and Brunson and I won five of them. You know, yeah. every day it was like, he takes the lead, he takes the lead, he takes the lead. And that bracelet race was talked about a lot from 2002 to 2007. And I kind of took the lead and I kind of, you know, jumped up to 14. You know, in 1993, when I won my third bracelet, I was also chip leader in the main event when it all fell apart. I mean, I completely self-destructed. I was just looking at, oh, my God, I just won three bracelets and I'm going to win the main event. It was like I wasn't ready to handle that. You know what I mean? Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go, actually, which was how many bracelets do you think you'll end up with? And who do you think of people nowadays could get closest to your total? I mean, I, I've it's just a weird thing. It's like the number 24 locked into my mind in 1993. <laughs> I'm going to win 24 bracelets. And so it's just really weird. I felt like, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, a scientist would say, oh, my God, you can't see the future, um, you know, but you can have a vision of the future and, and of your future. And it may not be correct. But for some reason, I just thought I'd win 24 bracelets. And this was back in when I won three in 1993. So I've hung on to that. I've gone public saying I want to win 24 bracelets. Um, I heard Phil Ivey say he wants to win 30. And then I thought to myself, yeah, why limit myself? When I hit 24, I'll reset. And so. Yeah, I mean, anywhere over 24 is a great number. Who can catch me? The second part of the question. Well, you know, Doyle Brunson stopped trying, and he's in his 80s. Um, but I believe he'd have more bracelets. And I believe he could have won more back in the day. Um, but he has 10. And then Shan kind of stopped trying, too. Shan enters three or four tournaments a year. He still finished fourth in a tournament. I mean, he's a greater player than people think, but he's just happy winning money. He has a lot of fame and notoriety in China, and uh, and I think he's winning a lot of money over there. Now, the guys that could catch me, potentially, uh, Phil Ivey, um, you know, I think he's the biggest threat. You know, Negreanu has six bracelets, man, and he's, uh, and he's dedicated, and he's really good at all the games, and he continues to get better. I mean, he was studying with the right people when it came to play, No Limit Hold'em. He might say bad stuff about me. I'll always say good stuff about him. Phil, you've, you've written quite a few books. Which is the one you're most proud of and why? Because it teaches people the game. Um, Poker Brat, I'm really proud of. It's 145,000 words. Now, if you, if you consider that 100 pages is 35,000 words, that can kind of translate to people that don't know 
how long that book is. Mm -hmm. But I thought Play Poker Like the Pros at 95,000 words was a tomb of a book. Did I pronounce that right? Tomb, tome. It was a monster book. <laughs> and then to do 145,000 words for the autobiography, and I wrote every word, you know? So I'm proud of that, and I think the story's very compelling. I mean, everybody that reads it or listens on audio, it's like 14 hours long on audio. And people just, everybody just says they can't put it down. They can't put it down. I'm excited about the next book called Positivity. I have a picture of the cover here. I think I'll show, which I think is kind of cool. It's a really cool cover. This book comes out February 1st. And, you know, it's, it's eight chapters. So there's a chapter, Life Goals, because that's what I thought was important. There's a chapter, you know, on how to write the life goals. And, and then there's a chapter on, you know, on how to, on, on a winning pyramid, because that's really helped me a lot. I call it a winning pyramid, um, and and people at home can can kind of design their own pyramid. Uh, there's a chapter, so those are short chapters. It's eight short chapters. There's a chapter on taping your life goals, not your life goals, but your yearly goals, and taping them to your mirror. Something I've done since the early '90s, because then those yearly goals are always in your mind. You can see them every day, mm. and so this it's kind of five short. It's kind of eight short chapters. And I think this book is just going to go crazy. I think I'm going to sell millions of copies. You know, you look at like the back of this. Sheryl Sandberg gave me a quote, the Facebook COO. Uh, Tony Robbins uh, gave me a quote uh, back here. And uh, let's see who else. <laughs> Need my glasses. Oh, Negranu's on here too. But it's pretty cool. Uh, I have some pretty cool people. And Tony Robbins uh, sent out a tweet for me, you know, talking about Poker Brat being inspirational. And uh, he'll send out a tweet for this book, Positivity. So it just kind of launches me uh, in a different sphere. I'll, I'll be giving positivity speeches. I'll probably start at, I don't know, I'm hoping I get to 100,000 in 2018 per speech because you know, I'm already, uh, my corporate rate's been 50,000 since 2005, 50,000 a night. And I think this is good because you can inspire people. Last night I gave the speech, and then they sent out this email. Who's interested in having Phil Helmuth speak? Well, they instantly sold out, which is not impressive because it was like 85 or 90 people. But they instantly sold out at this guy's house, and uh, just people came up to me afterwards, and they're just like, "Man, you know, it's just so inspiring." And you know, they kept calling me humble. And I'm like, "I'm not humble," and they're like, "Well, you really are." It's funny. My wife thinks I'm humble too, but. If you watch my footage and talking about how great I am at poker down. So I'm proud of that, but I think I'm going to be most proud of positivity because I think I can help millions of people. Everybody that reads it, there's a chapter on how hate hurts you and a three-step process for getting rid of hate in your life. And I think that I'm going to influence millions of people. I've already been on the Tim Ferriss show and fearless. And then he's taken clips and sent them out. Millions of people have listened to these clips and, and, and seeing the show. And it's been very interesting um, to see the feedback from that. Um, you know, people saying that I changed their lives. And so I think literally 100% of the people will get something out of positivity, 100%. And so, and so I'm really proud of that. And I think that's going to be a big legacy for me is, you know, and this is the first time in my life I was really worried about, you know, mortality. You know, and I thought, man, if I don't get this book out and, you know, if I were to die before this book comes out, it would just be it would just be tragic because I think I can help millions of people. And so, you know, I I finished it very quickly. I, I waited for Poker Brat and, you know, you don't launch a bunch book August 1st and then February 1st unless you're, you know, so I just wanted to make sure I got it out there. I emailed my wife, honey, if anything happens to me, make sure that this process is completed. Now I've finished the book. And uh, it's going to be out February 1st, and it feels really good. So, yes, I'll also make a lot of money. If I sell 3 million copies, I'll make <laughs> $21 million just from this book. Yeah. And I'll have videos because, you know, I think. So I'm really excited about kind of launching. And the name of the book is Hashtag Positivity. I'm really excited about where I'm going. And uh, it's going to be great for me. I would rather stand in front of an I rather than do an appearance I would much rather stand in front of an audience and do a keynote speak speech in front of a thousand people or two thousand people 
and kind of give them something that can improve their lives. So positivity is going to be my biggest legacy, I believe. One thing we have in common is the Share My Pair app. You're the best known ambassador and I'm the least known. Could you tell our listeners about it? Yeah, the Share My Pair app is really cool. Um, so I've been posting hands. I mean, you know, Steve Miller started the Share My Pair app and he came to me a long time ago, years ago, and said, hey, I want to do this app. And I was like, cool. And I ended up signing with him and it's very cool. So what it does is I will put a hand that I played with all the opponents and their hands, if they're relevant, and their chip stacks and their names. And I will talk about hands that I played. And so if you look at the share of my pair, I posted a couple of hands from the Bellagio $10,000 buy-in last week. And I've also posted some hands from my home game. And, uh, you know, some crazy stuff happens. And so these hands are just like, they're very cool and they're very educational for people. And, uh, you know, sometimes I say, wow, I played this bad. And sometimes I say, wow, I played this great. You have to be kind of balanced. It doesn't want, you don't want to be all about greatness. You want to show people that you're not perfect as well. Very good. We spoke to Tommy Angelo earlier in the show and we talked to him about tilt and the different types of tilt. Your blowups have obviously created some of the most memorable TV moments uh, in poker, but we wondered how tilty you really were. It seems like a lot of the time you let off steam, but then you basically sit back and play unaffected. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is a question I've been trying to solve for myself for years and years, and it felt like my tilt factor went way down once 2004, 2005 hit. But the fact is, when people watch me on television, they see me tilting. Now, usually my tilts aren't that long, so that's good. Um, but you know, I haven't had, you know, I haven't had, you know, in the book I talk about how my wife was thinking about leaving me in 01 and how I was thinking about leaving her in 2015. Great chapters from Poker Brat. And I think, you know, I was playing a little bit in 2015. You know, the smart thing that I did is I never cheated on my wife. I was super tempted. <laughs> I was hanging out with these amazing women. But I never cheated on my wife. I was pretty proud of that and uh, and realized that it wasn't about the other women. It was about my relationship with her. And I was kind of angry at her. And so, you know, there's a good resolution there. But I think people's worst tilts are when they're having problems in their primary relationship. And so during that 15, I think I lost four times in a row, but it wasn't much money. And then uh, and then I just the fifth time I won so much money, like it was crazy to put all of those lot. So it's rare that I ever lose three times in a row, uh, which is kind of nice. That's been going on for years. The first time I lose, I go crazy. The second time I lose, I'm just going, what the hell is going on? How could this happen? I examine every single hand I played in minute detail. And I just like, oh my God, it's like, I feel like way too intense considering I lost twice in a row. It's just re it's weird. I rarely lose three times in a row. Uh, but the tilt thing is something you have to keep an eye on. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I think sometimes I get rid of my tilt by being a poker brat. <laughs> 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 you know, I get rid of a lot of it and I might be steam for a minute or two. And then generally speaking, um, I do a pretty good job of not tilting. Well, Phil, you're doing all the segues for me so beautifully because uh, we actually spoke to Phil Lack just a few months ago about the Unabomber persona and he talked about his natural love of performing but also about his opportunism when it came to switching it on at the right moment on televised final tables or what have you. Similarly, that poker brat persona is something you appear to have both cultivated but also something which maybe emerged organically from within. Um, do you remember the birth of that moniker? where it came from? Oh, yeah. You know, again, in this in this book, Poker Brat, I talk exactly about the origins of Poker Brat. And, you know, it's pretty simple. Just imagine I'm the oldest of five. Imagine you have a father with a PhD, a JD, and an MBA. You know, PhD, a law degree, and an MBA. I mean, more letters after his name than anybody else I know or even have heard of. I'm sure there's people with more letters out there somewhere, but so he had all these letters after his name, and I'm the oldest of five, and I'm a guy. So the pressure for me to get good grades was intense. The pressure for me to be an athlete 
was intense. The pressure for me to play musical instruments, intense. Well, I didn't play musical instruments. I basically loved sports my whole life, but I was never great. And I was short all the way through eighth grade. When I was 13 or 14, I was one of the shortest kids in the class. It's after that that I grew. Not that I'm a great athlete anyway. <laughs> you know, I'm good. People would be surprised. But the fact is, I was not, and then the grade stuff with the ADD, I just wasn't cutting it. I was always 2.7 uh, over here in the States. That's, a, you know, A is 4.0, B is 3, you know, C is 2.0. I was always around 2.7, and my dad hated it. And I was never really applied myself. My true intelligence never really kind of shone through. And so there I was, you know, with nothing and my brothers and sisters getting straight A's. My brothers and sisters playing instruments. My brothers and sisters, you know, being, you know, really good at sports. And so they're just crushing it. I'm the oldest of five. I had nothing to kind of hang on to. Nothing, you know, no, not enough positivity in my life, you know. And, uh, you know, it was hard for me to get attention uh, because my brothers and sisters were so good at doing the stuff that my parents prized. And so then what did I have left? Games. So I became great at Scrabble, great at every game you can imagine. And, you know, backgammon, hearts, spades, all the games that we played. And we played a little bit of poker. And my, my mind was designed like I would just really know exactly what to do. And these days when a new game is developed in poker, when they come up with a new game, I think I'm the best in the world for the first couple of weeks, maybe month. Whenever they develop a new game, because... It just makes sense to me. And so that's one of my gifts. And so I did always, yes, I had a, I was older than my brothers and sisters, but I always smoked them at every game we played. And the rare occasion where my brother needed double sixes and double fives to beat me in a backgammon game, and he rolled it, I would just go crazy. <laughs> what the hell? How the, I won that game. You had to roll double sixes and double fives. Well, technically, I won the game. Yeah, you won the fucking game because you rolled double sixes and double fives. You were so lucky. You know, he'd be like, but I won the game. And so the poker brat with nothing else to hang on to, Phil Helmuth, you know, my early years, nothing else to hang on to, you know, couldn't lose a game. And if I did, I just acted up. And that translated to, you know, when I became a, a great poker player right away, I was winning tournaments all over the world right away. And so, you know, and I always seem to have the best hand. It's like something about Hold'em made sense to me that no one else understood. So I just kept getting there, getting there, getting there. Well, of course, I always had the best hand when the money went in. So I was taking these bad beats, bad beats, bad beats, because that's what happens when you're always a big favorite. You're going to lose some, obviously. And so I just kept taking these bad beats. And I just, in my mind, I'm like, I deserve to win that hand. How could you put the money in with ace jack offsuit? Didn't you know that I had queens or kings? What in the hell were you thinking? How could you put in 50 big blinds in the old days? We didn't use the term big blinds. How could you put so much money in with ace jack? You knew I had to have queens or kings. That was a horrendous play. And so rather than just say nice hand and see that the math, you know, worked against me, but maybe my kings had held up against ace jack earlier in the tournament, you know, I just would go crazy. It was like, it was like, all right, I have nothing else in my life except being great at poker. And so kind of the low self-esteem, you know, uh, developed the poker brat edge. <laughs>